listen, I have lived under the delusion <laughs> that Hollywood homicide isn't as bad as it is because it came on the heels of this. I went out of there going, what a piece of shit and haven't looked back until it got put on the schedule. And I'm like, ah, hell. Yes. But I came in. Open mind. Let's try it again. There's no planets. I'm in a home theater. I guess I have to pay attention. We'll see if you drilled holes through your roof to look at the stars while watching it. Was it, was it that bad? <laughs> oh, something happened. I'm saving that. But there's just, yeah. All right. Well, why don't we get into it then? Arnie, you give them the plot. We'll see if LXG is going to work for us now. It's the end of the 19th century, and the world is prepping for its first world war. A mysterious baddie calling himself the Phantom, but he's hip, so he calls, spells it with an F, has increased international tensions, robbing a bank in England while pretending to be German, then assaulting Germany while pretending to be British. So the British Empire decides it's time to pull together a new League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Throughout history, at dire times, men of great ability were brought together to defend the Empire. Now, the mysterious British officer called only M is tasked to do so again, pulling in aging adventurer Alan Quartermain, played by Sean Connery, and then the rest of the actors don't matter, scientific wizard and seaman Captain Nemo, vampire bite survivor Mina Harker, and an invisible man. Not the invisible man because of copyright issues, an invisible man, this one being Thief Rodney Skinner. Why isn't he black? Or is this not the Ralph Ellison version? <laughs> no, it's not the Ralph Ellison version. <laughs> okay, all right. Nor is it Hollow Man, nor is it Chevy Chase from the John Carpenter film. I mean, he may be black. We never do see him. <laughs> That's true. That is true. How great would that be? <laughs> the, the, the League of Invisible Men. And <laughs> Ralph Ellison's <laughs> Invisible Man and this one teaming up. <laughs> the four are sent to recruit two more members. First, the immortal Dorian Gray, played by Queen of the Dams, Stuart Townsend. That's what I know him from. It's only a thing you've done. Gray at first refuses, but when the Phantom attacks his home, he reconsiders. And that attack was only thwarted thanks to the intervention of American Secret Service agent Tom Sawyer, who has also come to try to stop the World War. Then the crew, joined by Sawyer, goes not so much to recruit as to capture Mr. Hyde, the hulking beast who sometimes transforms into nerdy, mild-mannered Dr. Jekyll. Finally, together they realize that the Phantom is going to try to destroy all of Venice, where the world leaders are meeting to talk peace. The League barely thwarts that plan, though it seems half of Venice is destroyed in the process, and Quartermain faces off with the Phantom, who was unmasked and revealed to be... M, who we saw once before. But returning to Captain Nemo's sub, the Nautilus, they find that first mate Ishmael has been killed by the traitorous Dorian Gray. They all thought it was the Invisible Man. But no, it's the immortal man who had infiltrated the group to steal their powers. He takes a skin sample from the Invisible Man, blood from Vampiric Mina, Dr. Jekyll's serum, and photos of Captain Nemo's tech. <laughs> because, you know, if I have a picture of a rocket, I can then build a rocket. <laughs> that is the funniest one to me. He's like, he took a picture of, like, the steering wheel of the ship, and we're going to recreate this. <laughs> Eight times. <laughs> With all of this, M plans to start a world war, and he'll be an arms dealer selling super soldiers to the highest bidder. The League survives a bomb Dorian planted on their boat and proceeds to Mongolia, where M has a factory developing the weapons. A major fight takes place. Hyde has to fight a super Hyde made from his formula. <laughs> Mina fights and kills Dorian by showing him a cursed painting that was the secret to his immortality. The Invisible Man dies of third-degree burns. That's a little morbid. And finally, Quartermain faces off against M, who, yes, reveals himself to be Sherlock Holmes' nemesis, Professor James Moriarty. Moriarty spears Quartermain, but Tom Sawyer gets the sniper shot in to take down the criminal mastermind. And the League returned Quartermain to be buried beside his son in Africa. But Quartermain had once said he was blessed by a witch doctor that Africa would not let him die. And indeed, a random witch doctor shows up and starts to perform a ceremony, and a bolt of lightning strikes Quartermain's grave as credits roll. I think that bolt was meant to just make sure to kill Sean Connery's career, if the movie didn't. <laughs> uh, the, I have a lot of behind the scenes on this that I got from fairly candid interviews that were on the blu-ray and on the dvd i was like wow you're really talking about this okay well we'll go with it if you're gonna talk about it i'm gonna talk about it 
But yeah, opening up, I felt like this movie might actually have something. We start with a little bit of a scroll that just talks about what the technology of the time had been to, I guess, remind perhaps history illiterate Americans that in the 1800s, all we had was cavalry and horse drawn cannons, not the stuff we're going to see here. Well, this is the fun of steampunk is that talking about, you know, the future, what's to come, the 20th century weapons, they're going to invent a false history for how they come to be here. I think it's fun. And I don't know if that's necessarily for dumb Americans. I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in the place of what these filmmakers are trying to go through. And if you're not paying attention to the year 1899 when this tank shows up at the beginning, it might not necessarily seem out of place unless you've read everything that's they've presented in front of you. So they, they got to set the setting somehow. I mean, they morph into this steampunk 20th century Fox logo and they try to set it up, but they got to tell you something to get your bearings right away because this tank has to seem out of ordinary when it shows up. Yeah, I like this scene. I mean, it's it's all these bobbies running around. You think it's like a Jack the Ripper scenario, and then all of a sudden, yes, it's it's World War One, twenty years early, with with tanks like rolling through the bank, and yeah, okay, it makes no sense. They're stealing drawings blueprints. of Leonardo. <laughs> no, they're not blueprints. Yeah, they are. Are but they say they are, but when you look at them, they're sketch drawings of buildings. <laughs> they're not blueprints. There's nothing about the layout of Venice from any image that we see. They are just pretty pictures of buildings on canals. But this is what they're going to use to plant bombs to blow up Venice. They've been well preserved for being from Leonardo da Vinci. This opening reminded me of one from a better movie that would come later, Captain America, when the Red Skull just kind of rolls in with a tank to that church to try to find the Tesseract. Only here they're trying to find the plans. I was kind of going with it. Until the Phantom is asked what he wants, and he's like, I want the world. And with his mask and everything, I got a strong Cobra Commander vibe off him. No, no, Destro. He's got that metal face. I... Well, Cobra Commander had the silver mask, and the way he yeah. hisses his S's in this one scene, I'm like, he's hissing. Am I watching G.I. Joe? I don't want to. Well, you, you call out some of the dialogue here. I got to feel like this is really James Robinson. Like, and this stuff would almost work in a comic book. Like, what do you want? The world. I mean, so, the Phantom, very operatic. Yo. Trouble? I call it sport. Like, I feel like these are things I've read in comics, but it doesn't work on the screen here. Yeah, the screenplay, you called out the screenwriter, James Robinson. Is that someone I should know? No, I mean, he did in the 90s a, a very, I highly recommend it, run on Starman, which is the most 90s comic in a good way that you'll read. It's all about a Generation X guy, like, that doesn't care about his father's generation, and, and it's great. I can't recommend a whole lot more that he's done, though. Okay. But he's he's pretty proficient in the comic book world. He's done a lot of stuff. He's the one letting this concept down at every turn here is that I love the art direction. This movie is beautiful to watch. If you turned off the sound, you would <laughs> highly enjoy this movie. The art direction, the costuming, being there is just great. I will grant them. They have a tremendous look here. I said I like steampunk in pictures and that I like it in costumes. They do it well here. I actually listened to the commentary and I really didn't need to gain nothing of the affects people and the costume designer and they go into great detail about how they found every costume for each person and tried to make it period authentic and things that shows on the screen i don't know if they had enough money to make the film they wanted to make oh no there's parts that don't look so great when we get to yeah. the cgi later we're yes. gonna be curtailing the compliments but i'm just saying here in the beginning it's a great looking world yeah i i say it stands through venice and most of it this whole thing, by the way, shot in Prague. Yeah. Oh, they went all over the world for this. I, I was surprised. No, no, they went to Prague. <laughs> well, not according to IMDb. Then IMDb lied. They went yeah, to Prague. Okay. No, yeah, Arnie's right on this one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> they, they did go to a back lot or two in L.A. for some pickups. In Santa Clarita. That was the funniest thing. It, it's so like, for some pickups. Yeah. On yeah. IMDb, they have all these exotic locations, and then Santa Clarita, which is where I grew up, which is not exotic. <laughs> yeah, they were in the Czech Republic the entire time because they wow, could find okay. an ocean. They could find a desert. And I've been to Prague. It's a beautiful city. What I love is they said that Prague looks just like 19th century England without any set dressing. It does. I love Prague. It's a 
beautiful city for that reason. And yeah, it, it's gorgeously used here. And this movie, between the art director and the natural beauty, I just think it's a fun world. Even when nothing is making sense. Yeah, they go to Berlin the next month. Uh, why is he shooting a harpoon into a line of Hindenburgs? Uh, these Zeppelins are being blown up. <laughs> because the Hindenburg. Yeah, but why? He's framing the British. He's attacking the Germans, yeah. pretending to be British. He's attacking. Did you read the newspapers? But why a grappling hook? You don't want to be connected to a flaming Zeppelin as it's falling on you. Because they hadn't invented bazookas yet? The rope doesn't stay attached. It was spring-loaded. That was a giant uncoiling spring. Oy, okay. Really? Yeah. So nothing makes sense here. And here's where I go instantly. I recommended the movie Constantine or Constantine purely because I enjoyed the world and the visuals. And it was just kind of fun to be there. That's where I'm at with this movie. I know it's a whole lot of stupid, but it's professionally made. And once we get to Kenya and Sean Connery, I feel like I can finally latch on to something that is a lot of fun to watch here. This feels like Indiana Jones 4. So you've seen so many shitty, low-budget <laughs> movies the past three weeks that because it's professionally made, you're willing <laughs> to leg hump it. God. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. And that, that should count for something. A great looking movie should be celebrated at any given time, but particularly after what we've been through. Look, I am not down on the movie at this point. Like, this whole thing in Kenya, it's a little slapstick. Quartermain's going to get in a fight with some of the Phantoms people who have, like, uh, what? They saw Back to the Future 3 and, and made bulletproof vests, and they got machine guns. Who has automatic guns? But, you know, he's fighting with a lion's paw from a taxidermied lion, and, uh, like, they, they can't go R-rated with this violence, so it plays a little slapstick. I'm going with it at this point. I'm like, oh, yeah. Indiana Jones 4. If Indiana Jones 4 was this good, I'd be pleased. Admittedly, I will grant you that. This is, looks better and is more fun than Indiana Jones 4 and less infuriating. And Sean Connery, he is giving the same performance he gives all the time. I love Sean Connery, so I'm good with this. I just don't like his wig. He is the reason, though, we don't know any of the other actors here. <laughs> On this supposed $78 million budget... He was almost 20 of it. Mm, okay. I was wondering why there was absolutely no one else here to recognize. And admittedly, the stars of this are the literary characters. You don't necessarily need to have A-list names, but star power counts for something. And Sean Connery has a whole lot of it, and nobody else has any of it. That is the distraction. And if you're going to have an ensemble film, there should be some balance there. Definitely. To have one star that shines so bright and a whole bunch of absolute nobodies. Now, I'm not saying they cast poorly. I think the guy who plays the Invisible Man is a lot of fun. We'll talk about Hyde when we get there. I can't say a whole lot about the rest of them. They're whatever. But the fact that I know this movie as Sean Connery and The Doors. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, is that's even when I brought it up to people like, oh, yes, I'm watching League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. They were like, oh, wasn't Sean Connery in that? They they couldn't remember the concept. They couldn't remember anything other than him. I mean, that's what they marketed this movie as. Sean Connery, yeah, more or less coming back. Imagine Indiana Jones 4, in which we go back and see Indy's dad have an adventure. I mean, it's because of this movie, you will never see that. <laughs> Alan Quartermain was one of the characters in which they based those serials that Indiana Jones came from. So allow me to show my yank ignorance. Who's Alan Quartermain? King Solomon's mind. Yeah. Uh, was is the big one okay and is, it's a book yes yes <laughs> old books yes 1850 but no copyright that's how they can use the name yes but uh, seriously you never saw the movie in the 80s richard chamberlain never oh wow okay well i wouldn't wish it upon you it's it's dreadful yeah. <laughs> but it is a version of indiana jones before there was indiana jones I mean, I get everything I need to from Connery's performance. He's an old adventurer. They set it up in the beginning. They talk about King Solomon's minds. I'm like, okay. But of all the characters in this, the star is the one I've never read. I have read books about all the rest of them. And I'll say this, whether this is a good or bad thing, who can say? But I don't feel like you have to really know these characters from literature to get who they are on the film. Like, we're going to get Quartermain's character and the deal with his son. Like, that's all on the screen. You don't have to have read King Solomon's Minds to 
appreciate or to get at least what they're going to do with the character here. Did they read it? 